country you're in, but uh, that's fine. What you uh, in Argentina, se dice Isachagov, pero como como te guste. Oh, sorry about that. So, uh, Professor Samuel, we will speak about democracy, democracy and words. And it is the, 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 the title, the beginning of the title of his last book that is forthcoming. I'd like to say thank you very much and thank you, uh, thank you all of you. So, Professor. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure. Um, as I was saying earlier, I was in Kuichiba last year for a couple of lectures. Um, it is not the same to do it from here, but it's uh, a lot easier <laughs> in uh, terms of travel. Um, so I, I've been thinking a lot about uh, the, the conditions for uh, democracies to succeed. And this has been uh, a long academic journey for me, beginning even before I was an academic when I was a uh, practicing lawyer and I defended uh, voting rights of, uh, of minorities in the United States. And the question of the relationship between the majoritarian component of democracy and what the deeper commitments of democratic societies must be is a question that has uh, been uh, a source of, uh, of inquiry for generations, in fact, for centuries, in fact, for millennia. You can go back to the Greek discussions of the conditions for uh, proper representation. And in 2015, I published a book called Fragile Democracies, in which I tried to examine both how the new democracies were emerging of the third wave, what's termed the third wave, the post-1989 effectively, although some of the transitions in South America were before 1989. Nonetheless, it was all these new democracies that were emerging in uh, the post-Cold War period. And the aim of that book was to try to figure out what were the necessary preconditions for uh, democratic uh, success. Uh, certainly it could not be simply holding an election. Certainly it could not be uh, the idea that there would be some kind of consultation of the population. And uh, the conclusion of that book was that uh, it depended greatly on the capacity of the institutions of democratic governance to cohere. And those were importantly uh, the political parties, the success of the legislative branch, uh, the development of civil society, the idea, the internalization of contestation. And the conclusion of that book was that these institutions don't all develop at once. And that what had emerged in the post-1989 period was that uh, constitutional courts were holding the fort, as it were, were protecting these nascent institutional arrangements for a period of time until the full blossoming of democratic potential could take hold or not. Um, what I have become concerned with in the last five years is the flip side of this question, which is what happens in countries where these institutions have to a lesser or greater extent taken hold and including to a very great extent as includes uh, countries like the United States and Britain. And then you begin to have retrocession. You begin to have erosion of these institutions um, partially because of political attacks by populism, but partially because uh, democracies have not been doing particularly well in terms of protecting their citizens, in terms of guaranteeing basic uh, conditions of life, in terms of socioeconomic disparities, income maldistribution. And uh, that's the topic of the current book, which is uh, what happens when democracy is taken off of its institutional foundations, hence the title of the image of democracy being unmoored, being adrift without uh, some sort of institutional root. 
Um, and so let me begin uh, with a story. I'd like to tell stories as you saw from the introductory chapter. And let me tell a story about uh, being in Buenos Aires in August, 2016. I was there, uh, I had been working on some uh, reforms to the, uh, uh, the laws in Argentina on uh, how you fund political parties. And one of the uh, proposals, a very minor one that I had uh, put forward, had actually been passed into law. And at that time it was being considered and finalized. And so I was asked to come down and give some talks around this. And in August, 2016, I found myself being interviewed on the television station of La Nación, which is the main oligarch newspaper, old wine, liberal in the classic liberal sense, newspaper of Argentina. And uh, I was there to speak about the um, uh, election laws in Argentina and the general democratic processes in Argentina, but it was a very long interview, it was about 20 minutes. And they were more intrigued, not by my views on Argentina, but by the fact that I had been a lawyer for Obama and that Donald Trump had just become the nominee of the, um, of the Republican Party. And so they said, we'd like to ask you some questions about Obama. I said, I wanna talk about Obama. You know, they said, yes, but he was just here. Michelle was just here. It was a great visit. We talked a little bit about that. Then they said, what about Trump? And I said, Trump cannot be the president of the United States. And I said, um, Unfortunately, I was tired and I said, he has neither the intellectual nor the moral capabilities to be president of the United States. So the next morning's headline was, Obama lawyer says Trump has neither the intellectual nor the moral uh, foundations to be president of the United States. And right then I, I knew I was not going to be a member of the Trump cabinet. I knew for many reasons, but that, that uh, confirmed it. They asked me why, and this is what I want to talk about. I said, and this was the first time I thought in these terms. I said, if you listen to Trump speak, he says, always I. I know, I want, I do. It's always about the first person. The custom in the United States for any president or potential president speaking to the American people is to begin by saying, my fellow Americans. And my fellow Americans is an indication of a collective democratic project. And I is, as I said in that interview, the language of the caudillo, the language of the ruler who stands above and who demands loyalty to him in his private person. And it doesn't have to be him. I would put Christina Kirshner in this category, but it it generally is a him. So just uh, I will probably use uh, the uh, male pronoun in this talk. And so um, I was then asked about, well, couldn't he become president? I said he could become president, but it would be a limited endeavor because uh, he would confront immediately all the institutions of governance in the United States that are well-rooted. We have civil society, we have a legislative branch, we have a great number of institutional buffers between the head of state and the administration of democratic governance. And uh, the what I want to talk about today is the surprising fragility of those institutions of democracy, not just in the countries that were once under military dictatorships like Brazil and Argentina, not just in the countries that are emerging from uh, the Soviet orbit, like all the uh, Eastern European uh, countries, and not just the countries coming out of apartheid or some other form of social command as in Taiwan. And surprisingly, these institutions have been significantly and substantially eroded, not just in Poland and Hungary, but in Great Britain and in the United States as well. And so when one examines these institutions, and this is the, the core of the book project, um, 
what you have is two elements that define successful democratic governance. The first is the idea of repeat play. Um, the idea that there is a, an ongoing engagement between the, uh, the, the political actors such that they accept, I may lose today, but I may win tomorrow. And if I win today, it, I could very well lose tomorrow. And the second that comes from that is the core principle of democratic governance, which is different from democratic election. The core principle of democratic governance is that the majority should win, but it should not win too much. And that is what is at the heart of the populist challenge, in my view. First of all, there is an unmediated claim to authority by the head of the movement. And again, I will invoke uh, Argentina as an example. Uh, under Peronism. Juan Perón never formed a political party. He always formed the movement. And the movement had different institutional forms, but they came and went and they were irrelevant. It was Peronism. It was Perón. It's indicative that the Republican Party at its just concluded convention did something unheard of in the United States. It refused to adopt the party platform. Instead, it just professed its loyalty to Donald Trump. This is the Caudillo style that in, 2000, in the interview in, in Buenos Aires in 2016, I thought could never come to the United States. So there's the unmediated claim to authority by the maximal leader. If you want to put this in democratic terms, this is a plebiscitary rather than representative notion of democracy. If you want to put it in game theoretic terms, which I think is quite helpful for understanding this, it turns repeat play into a single shot game. And the core of game theory is that in any prisoner's dilemma, in any time you have a confrontation between two sides and there's a yes, no question to be decided, there is no stable resolution. There must be repeat play. That's why game theory speaks about the iterated pr prisoner's dilemma as being solvable or manageable, whereas the one shot game is never solvable, never manageable. And so that's that's the uh, the first point. The second is that the populist challenge operates under a compressed time frame. Um, and I want to come back to the consequences of this later on, because that ties into the theme of corruption, which I know is not a topic you discuss in Brazil very much, but uh, but I, you will indulge me that I will speak about corruption in the United States and not in Brazil. Um, but uh, the compressed time frame means that everything is now. There is no long-term plan. I mean, you know, if you go back to the the uh, the Soviet uh, love of five-year plans, at least it's a five-year plan. Uh, there's no long-term projection. Again, I will use the Republican uh, National Convention and its abandonment of a. Uh, of any kind of, um, of, uh, of party platform as an example of this. Um, the third is the, um, uh, the non-institutional patterns of governance. And uh, by that, I mean that there is in under populism an attempt to dismantle the career civil service whether that's simply a firing of competent people, a promotion of cronyists, uh, there is um, a desire to have discretionary authority uh, in the maximal leader. And that gets to the next point, which um, in my book, I refer to as uh, caudilloism. Uh, I like the term caudillo because at least in Spanish, it's tremendously evocative of the cavalry and the, the great figure on top of the horse. Uh, um, and, 
Um, so I want to introduce that term uh, to the, the discourse because it's different than an autocrat. It's different than a dictator. Um, it is the leader in his own superior authority as uh, el comandante, as the one who is in charge. And the nature of uh, caudillo rule is first that there is a transactional nature of governance. Now, it helps that in the United States, we have a president who thinks that his great achievement was the uh, putting his name to a book that somebody else wrote called The Art of the Deal. But The Art of the Deal is all about everything is a subject to a one-on-one -on -one negotiation. That's why uh, under Trump, we repudiated uh, multilateral treaties and we tried to negotiate things on a one-by-one -one basis. Um, and what's the, what the importance of this transactional quality to governance is that everything is discretionary to the head of state and everything is by dispensation of the head of state. So it creates conditions of loyalty to that one individual who is the commander uh, of, uh, of the government, uh, who has governmental authority. That means that there is a necessary uh, diminution of the role of the career civil service. I spoke about that before. There is hostility to separation of powers. Uh, populist governors, it, with some strange exceptions, uh, like Yaroslav Kaczynski in, in Poland, tend to govern against the legislature, tend to govern against the parliamentary authority. Um, they tend to bristle at separation of powers. Again, to give the example of the United States, we've had more direct confrontations, including leading to major Supreme Court decisions between the executive and Congress than we've had in any four year stretch in American history, including during the Civil War, including during World War II, which were times of maximal uh, demands for executive power. Um, and it is the repudiation of the accountability to uh, the congressional authority. It is uh, profoundly anti-media and anti-civil society institutions that are at best, in their best use, mechanisms of accountability of uh, governmental authority. And those tend to be ass assaulted in the United States we hear the chant of fake news. We hear this uh, claim that there are alternate facts that can be put forward outside of science. Um, we even had our president, as crazy as this might sound to you, uh, uh, promote an untested drug for COVID, uh, hydrochloroquine. Uh, I don't know if such a thing would ever happen in Brazil, but it happened in the United States. Uh, I know, I know. <laughs> Um, we live, we're living the same kind of bizarre um, experience. Um, and then finally, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, there's two more. Uh, there's one more. Uh, finally, uh, there is the sense that the state can be captured for personal advancement. And this takes two forms. One is uh, the increasing role of the family entourage to substitute for the lack of an institutional political party that's there. So I don't know whether uh, President Bolsonaro has any relatives who might be implicated in any uh, activities, but let me just give you in the United States, again, uh, I will take pride in our domestic uh, uh, problems and not yours. Um, but uh, in the United States, we have uh, the most significant person in government is the son-in-law of the president who holds no official position. The second most influential is probably the daughter who also holds no influential position. Uh, you have the use of connections to the family for financial advancement in trivial matters such as 
Trump taking uh, all his vacations at his own properties and making government officials stay there and using government funds to pay uh, exaggerated rates in his, in his properties. But this is not unusual. It, in Argentina, it was the Kirshner family that had to flee the country because they did not enjoy parliamentary immunity. Uh, in country after country, you have the concentration of power and connections in the immediate entourage of the populist head of state. And what I want to suggest is that this is not an accident. It's not simply, uh, uh, it's not simply a matter of uh, nepotistic desire to advance one's children, but it is a reflection of the absence of any other institutional framework in which to, uh, to through which to govern. There's a long standing discussion about the conditions under which societies break down into ethnic strife and religious strife and things of that sort. And when the state is not functioning, then people have to have more primal connections in order to provide security. So when you get a breakdown of the state in Lebanon or in the former Yugoslavia and the civil society institutions don't take hold and the intermediary institutions such as political parties don't take hold, people have to rely on kinship groups. They draw narrower and narrower circles. And what we're seeing in these populist forms of governance is the family becomes the entourage of who is trusted. Nobody else has real power in these circumstances. Now, this leads to a certain characteristic, which uh, I'm not going to focus on today, but is the, the uh, a remaining part of the book, which I did not give you. And it's also uh, an article that's coming out uh, in uh, International Constitutional Law Journal in not too well, I don't know when, whenever they publish it. Um, but it's the idea that when you don't, when you have non-institutional rule, certain things happen. You get a great deal of cronyism. That is, you get advanced by connections to the maximal leader, whether it's family or proximity. You get a great deal of clientelism. So I begin the book with a description of the uh, of uh, Christina Kirshner running for re-election uh, in Argentina and using the instrumentalities of the state to dispense massive public welfare benefits, which if they were part of a generalized program, one could debate yes or no, but on the eve of an election to start just giving out television sets and beef and milk and so forth, has the feel of using the coffers of the state as a private reservoir for preferred groups. And that kind of clientelism we see going on in the United States. We see uh, Trump at this point trying to inflate the currency, trying to give away special deals to farmers. And in fact, some of his international um, uh, incidents, as we, if we can call them that, leading to both the impeachment and some of the other scandals, were always attempts to get foreign governments to subsidize some group in the United States in order to promote his electoral chances. So this idea of clientelism and cronyism uh, all means that you get wealthy, you get power, uh, in connection to uh, the maximal leader. And that then leads to the final step, which is if you can give out benefits to whomever you want, at some point you will ask for something yourself. And uh, I tell my students every year that there are very few absolute rules in life, but one of them is that anybody who is a gatekeeper at some point becomes a toll collector and uh, that uh, they will exact their, uh, uh, their contribution. So um, in the ch chapter, one of the chapters I gave you, uh, I draw from this uh, a few uh, conclusions about uh, 
the conflict between populism and the and key conceptions of democracy. And uh, let me give you five, and then let me uh, 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 conclude with some thoughts about uh, something that I'm thinking a great deal about right now. It's still in formation, so it's very helpful to discuss, uh, and that is uh, political parties in particular. So there's five key conceptions of democracy that I uh, that I set out that populism cannot uh, abide by, and uh, they are uh, first the temporal dimension, the idea that there is a long time horizon. I talked about the repeat play. Uh, this notion that um, uh, this is just but one election. Uh, Michael Ignatieff. Uh, has a very uh, nice way of framing this, that democracy requires that we consider the opponents to be adversaries, but not enemies. And that this is not, um, you know, in the, in the language of the old internationale, this is not the final struggle. This is not the end game. This has to be just one along a, a, in a long path of, uh, of contested elections. The second key to democratic governance is fractionated power. And this goes back to Montesquieu, it goes back even further. Um, the idea that uh, there is a primacy to the directly elected branch, meaning the legislature, but that power must be divided between the various branches of, of the uh, institutional state. Um, and here, uh, let me just mention in passing uh, a, the, something I, I also referenced earlier, which is that one of the high, one of the key uh, developments at present, and also one of the most uh, dangerous and damaging uh, features of contemporary democracy, is the weakness of the legislative branch. There are almost no democracies in the world today that have a functional uh, policy-driven legislative branch that drives uh, democratic governance. Uh, it's certainly not true in the United States. Uh, it has never been true in Argentina. Uh, it has failed to be true in Britain. It has certainly collapsed in France. Um, Brazil, it's very hard to understand the Brazilian Congress. I, I confess from, from having tried for quite some time, I, I can't make heads or tails out of it. Uh, but uh, that's my fault, not Brazil's, I'm sure. Um, but there is uh, there are a few countries where the legislature still functions, Canada, Germany, but shockingly, uh, shockingly few. Um, the third is... Um, the importance of intermediary organizations. The more uh, one looks at how democracy has functioned over the past two centuries, the modern era, I don't wanna speak about the direct democracy of the Greeks, but the modern mass participation democracies of, that have emerged in the last two centuries, we see that the intermediary organizations provide uh, the central organizing uh, uh, apparatus for democratic governance and most centrally the political parties. And it is one of the features of, unfortunately, virtually all democratic countries right now that the mainstream, mainstay political parties have collapsed or are in the process of collapsing. So if one looks at Germany, you see that the post-war parties are a minority. If you look at India, uh, the Congress party, which was once dominant, has disappeared. If you look at France, France for the first half century after the war was divided government effectively between the Gaullists and the socialists with the socialists as the largest opposition, except occasionally when they would, uh, when they would rise up. Uh, and both of those parties have collapsed. Um, if you look at the collapse of the Labour Party in, in Britain, um, you see persistent weakness in these parties. In the United States, um, 
the Democratic Party was able to reorganize itself out of hostility to Donald Trump and to turn back to its old guard. But the Republican Party was taken over by Donald Trump almost as a hostile takeover. The Democratic Party was almost taken over by Bernie Sanders. And the key thing for that you have to keep in mind is whatever you think of their politics, Donald Trump was never a Republican and Bernie Sanders never joined the Democratic Party to this day. He is not a member of the Democratic Party, and yet outsiders were able to come in and take over uh, these very weakened institutions. The fourth is that uh, democratic governance depends upon uh, some level of transparency. And obviously, there's going to be police and national security limitations on this, but there have to be independent regulators to check the the sheer size and power of the modern state. And it is not surprising to see that the one area where Donald Trump has been extremely successful has been in the removal of a category of people called inspectors general, which is congressionally appointed inspectors who have the right to oversee the conduct of the executive branch. Um, and then finally, um, the norms of governance. And this is a, uh, I, I tend to dislike the use of the word norms because it, uh, I forgive me, but at heart, I'm still a Cartesian. And I like things that can be proven only if they can also be disproven. And norms is one of these soft formulations that's very difficult to disprove. But there are certain norms of governance that take hold over time. In a very uh, recent paper of mine with our uh, dean at NYU, Trevor Morrison, we try to give a little more content to this idea, what we call constitution by convention, the idea that uh, practices of the institutional actors take hold and can be constitutionally enforced over time. It's a notion that draws from Burke and a very conservative political theory tradition. Um, but these norms are there. And so let me just give you a couple of recent examples from the last week of the kinds of norms that are being degraded in the United States, but I could give these same examples in country after country. So in the United States, we had the Secretary of State giving a, a convention talk from a foreign uh, embassy to, uh, well, not from the embassy, from the hotel, the King David in, in Jerusalem. The Secretary of State as head of the diplomatic side of the government has never spoken at a political convention. There's nothing in the constitution that forbids this. There's no statute that forbids this, but it's just understood that you separate the representation of the government from the political process, broken down. Uh, we have a prohibition on the use of governmental office as an election prop. And yet we saw the White House being used as an election symbol. We saw the Republican convention in effect being run from the back lawn of the White House. Um, we have laws that say that uh, uh, the government officials cannot engage uh, in political activity during their, uh, their time on the job. And yet we had a federal housing official using her official role to interview tenants in New York about the conditions of public housing and then distilling that into a two minute video for showing at the Republican National Convention. This is not only, uh, there's not only a norm against that, there's a federal statute against that, which will never be enforced under this administration. So there is a breakdown of all of these features that is respect for institutions, respect for the civil service, separation of authority, institutional pathways, which necessarily cool, restrain the ability to get what you want today. And also going back to my introductory formulation, 
makes sure that the majority wins, but not too much so that it's not the last election uh, that we are holding. So let me finish with, um, with two other points. The first is um, the focus on political parties. And I just want to highlight um, a portion of, uh, of what I wrote. It was still a little underdeveloped when I sent you the chapters. Um, but, I, but this is something which has uh, struck me. So there, is a, there are two literatures in uh, political economy and um, they are not well developed and they don't address each other, but they both make the same point. Uh, one is on under what conditions do you have corruption in a country? And the second is under what conditions is there investment in technology for the future in any particular country? And both literatures make the same point. I'm going to distill it down to just the key uh, takeaways. The first is you need a long time horizon. And so if you're playing only for today, you don't invest in technology. You don't you don't uh, avoid corruption because if you're playing only a one shot game, you might as well take everything you can. It's it becomes a, a variant of the dictator game, if not the ultimatum game, and there is no point in holding out. The second is that there has to be coordination of the political agenda because. If there is a long time horizon, there has to be buy-in from major institutional actors. Otherwise, you don't get the restraint upon, um, upon either just taking state assets for yourself, corruption, or just consuming everything today and not investing into the future. And, if, and the literature happens to be on technology, but you could have it under what conditions do you build bridges? To, under what conditions do you build infrastructure of any kind? Um, and the third is that there has to be stability of leadership in the sense that part of the leading cadres of today anticipate being in power tomorrow. The, um, the, what the game theory and the political economy point out is that um, if I am the maximal leader, and I have no one else to be accountable to, I should just take everything for myself. And the key example, or an example, is the Argentine juntas, who unlike the, I, I hate to say this, but the more responsible juntas in Brazil and Chile and Uruguay, the Argentines simply plundered. So you had three generals, they plundered, but nobody else got any of the benefits of that. So after a year or two, they were overthrown by another junta who plundered everything they could. And then they would be overthrown by yet another junta and who plundered everything they could. You need to have loyalty from the lower ranks. You need to have not just the generals, but the lieutenants and the colonels being part of the enterprise. And what that means is you have to have a credible commitment to leave something for the future so that there is something to inherit for those who are part of the movement. And the reason political parties are important is because political parties not have, have not only a president, but a vice president, and they have a treasurer, and they have local heads of the political parties, and they all have to be guaranteed that there's something they will inherit or they will not work for this political party. When generals get too greedy in the military dictatorships of old, they know who's going to overthrow them. It's the colonels and the lieutenants who are going to overthrow them because those are the people who see that there's nothing left for them in the future. And um, the difference between uh, regimes capable of planning over time and instilling loyalty is that, and those that are for just today, is that there must be credible commitments to postponing rewards to leaving things, to investing toward future gains. And um, when you have the best, I'm sorry, the conclusion of the literature is that the best way of getting this 
is by having stable political parties. I would like to hope that it means competitive political parties, but in East Asia, much of the technological revolution took place with a single dominant party. Um, but it also helps to explain uh, the propensity of populist regimes to collapse in corruption scandals because there is no barrier to simply grabbing everything one can today. So let me stop here and just say um, the uh, question is, can it be repaired if all of these are indications of democracy becoming uh, unmoored or unglued to its uh, institutional foundations? Um, what happens next? And I sent you perhaps improperly, but I started drafting a few pages of what the world looks like after Trump and what has to be done in the United States after November. Now, you know, there's, uh, there's a certain problem uh, with writing this uh, in August uh, and not in December. Um, and you can, you can understand what that is. Um, but I wanted to start thinking about what it means to try to repair these regime, these societies after a Trump, after a Duterte, after an Orban, after a Kaczynski, uh, after perhaps after a Bolsonaro, uh, depending on your views of the events of Brazil. Um, and uh, going back to the interview with La Nacion, I thought that Trump could not take hold in a serious way. And I was actually less disturbed by his election than I should have been because I thought the institutions of American governance were too strong. And uh, it's been a learning process for me. And that's what I hope to reflect in this book, that uh, these institutional forms that uh, both constrain and make possible uh, democratic governance are very hard to build. Um, and to my surprise, my shock, they are uh, unfortunately rather easy to tear down. So let me stop there and leave it to you all. Thank you. Thank you for so much for your talk, Professor. Uh, it reminds me your brief story at the beginning. I was in London with Professor Chantal Wolf, uh, January 2018. And she asked me about Bolsonaro and what were the chances of Bolsonaro becoming president? And they told her, none, none at all. <laughs> I was not so emphatic as you were because I didn't think there is any chance, there was any chance of him becoming president. And now, that's yeah. why we are professors and not stock pickers. <laughs> yes, and I, I would like that uh, for our last works, I would like to say that I hope it's going to be a post-Trump era from November on. I'm not so sure, nobody's sure, but I, I think everybody here with us hopes so. So, uh, can we have three questions in a row? Is that okay yes. for you? That's fine. Okay, we have here uh, Elo, Luisa Câmara, she's a professor at Federal University of Paraná, Guilherme, and Eduardo, our PhD students. Luisa? Obrigada, Katia. Uh, thank you, Professor. It, uh, I would like to thank you for the presentation and your text about uh, democracy that allows us to think about the global process of uh, democracy. And this is a very sensitive subject to Brazilian people, as you know. I would like to address you three short questions, but of course uh, you can choose one or more than one to answer, if you believe it's okay. The first one 
it's about the use of the of the concept of populism to designate the, this process of the demo, democratic decline i I ask this because this concept is used in Brazil and Argentina for at least, I think, 50 years to, to designate the inclusion of people in the politics and in democracy. So my question would be, why use uh, populism and not authoritarian? Is uh, there the same thing like an authoritarian leader and a populist leader? or if they are not the same thing, what's the difference between them? My second question, and it's really quick, it's about uh, your, your book and uh, the, you talk about institutions and I agree that institutions are being attacked all over the world. But as this has, as perceived by authors like Chantal Mouffe, the process has a lot to do with uh, the failure of these institutions to respond to popular demands. Mm -hmm. So my question would be, talking about institutions can help us to, to get out of this picture or perhaps before we should talk why these institutions didn't work to, to answer these popular demands. And the last one, it, it uh, is about uh, the economic, uh, methodology or the economic use of populist leaders do. And one of them you, you wrote is about income transfer mechanism to keep the, the people like uh, to, to make loyal. And I would like to ask to you, if, uh, how do you see or how do you analyze the, the work like uh, Wendy Brown's that link neoliberalism to authoritarian authoritarian leader, because in this connection, if uh, it's uh, correct, perhaps this kind of economic use would be different from what is said. That's it. Thank you for the opportunity to hear and to, well, to read your, your paper. Thank you. I, I should just add before the next one, if somebody is uncomfortable in English, I can listen in Portuguese if you speak slowly. So if necessary, uh, fine. Thank you, thank you. Uh, now, Guilherme. Thank you, Professor. It was a marvelous lecture and I can't wait to, to read the whole book. I have a question regarding the current model um, operating in the US. Um, do you think that United States should move away from the two-part system in order to establish a multi-party system? And related to that, how do you perceive the role played by the Supreme Court um, in many decisions dealing with electoral law, precisely um, the issue of gerrymandering and the uh, dealing with the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act as rendered by the decision Shelby v. Holder in 2012, I think so. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Guilherme. Eduardo? Eduardo. Uh, good, more, good, uh, good night. Uh, can, can you hear me? me? Yes. 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 Professor, it was uh, a great speech. I really enjoyed the lecture as well. I'm, I'm sure everyone here did. Uh, I would like to hear your impressions over the Trump open challenge to the election made through the ballot box. It interests because some people would place the beginning of the declining of the Brazilian democracy in the open challenge to the presidential results in 2014. So I'd like to hear your impressions of this, this, this practice. 
they include dark professors somehow? Okay, there's um, each question is uh, sounds like the topic of a lecture I have given for 45 minutes at one point or another, but I will try to uh, <laughs> uh, 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 stay uh, confined. So um, Eloise's three questions. Um, the first one is um, that the term populism is used as a pejorative, and I understand that. Um, and uh, the question is that populism is also a term that has uh, a long history, uh, not only in Latin America, but in uh, the United States, uh, the term was used for uh, mostly agricultural based um, political mobilizations at the end of the 19th century. And I believe that the first uh, use of the term goes back to Russia even earlier than that. Um, and generally populism is an attempt to mobilize around the established institutions under concerns that those institutions have largely failed and or that they do not uh, answer the question, the needs of the of the population. And that's why I begin uh, one of the two stories I tell uh, anecdotes I tell at the beginning is the contrast in Venezuela between uh, uh, the kind of liberal governance that Chavez was attacking and also the reason for Chavez's tremendous support uh, among broad sections of the Venezuelan population because Venezuelan democracy had largely ignored uh, those people and tolerated uh, um, a level of poverty completely at odds with the relative wealth of the society. So it's a terrible um, uh, thing to say when presenting parts of the book. Um, and I hate when authors do this, but I am afraid I will have to do this here. Um, and that is to say uh, that uh, I address some of these questions in other parts of the book that I did not, I did not give you, of course. Um, and so the opening section of the book is entitled The World the Populists Found. And it's basically a book about what uh, the world looked like in 2008, the democratic world. And it has a couple of components. The first is that the institutions were not working. The second was that uh, the uh, disparity in wealth between the sectors of the population, the distribution of income was increasingly uh, askew and that you had concentration of wealth at the top and increasing uh, poverty at the bottom. And more significantly than the poverty was the fact that the laboring classes, which were the foundations of democratic governance in Western Europe and the United States and Canada and so forth, had experienced an erosion of their living standards uh, as a result of globalization. And I am a fan of the consequence, the overall consequences of globalization, which between basically uh, 1980 and 2008 radically redirected wealth toward the poorer parts of the world. And that I am in favor of, but the wealthier societies did not cushion uh, their working population. And I don't want to get into the term neoliberalism and all of its uh, connections, um, but I think you are absolutely right that the anti-institutionalism of modern populism uh, uh, is, uh, cannot be um, uh, uh, um, divorced from the failure of these institutions to function. And so that's why the beginning of the book is about the failure of the legislative branch, the failure of political parties, the failure of uh, the kinds of social programs, particularly in the face of changed demographics of the society, the pressure of immigration, the need to integrate uh, new groups, whether it's in the United States or in Europe. Uh, uh, in, in many, many parts of the world at this point. Um, 
the point you ask, and this one, this is the last point I'll make uh, on, on, uh, on your uh, point, is why do I use the term populism and not authoritarianism? Bec it's, and the answer is that in the most recent Polish election uh, six weeks ago, uh, President Duda almost lost. In Hungary, uh, the opposition controls Budapest. In Turkey, the opposition controls Istanbul. And I was in India in uh, February during the elections in the state of Delhi. And the reality was that the, uh, uh, the opposition party controlled completely the elections in Delhi and uh, the BJP, uh, Prime Minister Modi's party, came in a distant third there. And this was not possible under the Soviets. This is not possible in North Korea. It is, there is a difference between simple authoritarianism and these kinds of autocratic, non-liberal, illiberal regimes that are elected. And I think it is important to keep, keep, to keep focused on the fact that they are elected. That gives them their legitimacy, but it's also their vulnerability. And uh, I'll get back to a question in a second on the attacks on the integrity of the electoral process. But the reason for the attacks on the integrity of the electoral process is that these regimes believe they have to win the election. And if they do not win the election, they lose their mandate to speak uh, for the people. Um, uh, let me go to Eduardo's question because that follows from this and, I'll, and then I'll come back to Guillermo. Um, Eduardo asked me about uh, the Trump challenge to electoral integrity, and this is extremely dangerous for us. Um, in 1960, we had an, a very problematic election in the United States. There were uh, issues of potential fraud. There were very close contested uh, results in a couple of states and a very narrow victory for John Kennedy over Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon pulled everything down and said, that's the election spoke and that's it and did not try to attack the integrity of the electoral process. In uh, 2000, even with the Bush and Gore uh, election challenge, which ended up in the Supreme Court, uh, at the point at which it was clear that the votes were not there for Gore and that there would not be a recount, obviously the Supreme Court participated in this, it was over and George Bush became the elected president. Um, it is a fact in the United States that we elect through this arcane institution called the Electoral College, which means that a president can be elected with a minority of the popular vote. And yet we accept that as legitimate on you know, the few occasions when it has occurred, including with President Trump. Um, the attempt to destabilize the political agenda, the, the legitimacy of elections in the United States is exceedingly dangerous because it means that uh, there is a, an incipient, incipient call for alternative dispute resolution. And by alternative dispute resolution, we're seeing some of it in the streets in the American cities right now. And the president is promoting that. Um, we do not have the tradition of the military interceding. I think that even in Brazil, the military is would be extremely leery of intervening again today, uh, although I know far less about Brazil. Uh, but in the United States, it seems basically inconceivable that the military would intercede. But there are other mechanisms that might be provoked. So I'll give you a little bit of American constitutional law, two seconds of the nightmare scenario. Our constitution says that the president is selected by the electoral college. There is no guarantee of a vote for the electoral college representatives. In fact, in the initial design, these were appointed by the state legislatures. And the constitution says in any fashion that the state legislature shall designate. One of the risks of what Donald Trump is doing is that he will attempt to delegitimize the election so as to legitimize Republican 
legislatures in states that may very well go democratic, including key states like Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, uh, uh, Florida, from the legislatures are simply saying, we don't believe the elections worked. And so we're going to step into the void and appoint electors who will, of course, be pro, uh, uh, pro Donald Trump. Um, that's a risk. That's a danger. And it's being used strategically uh, in order to try to demoralize the opposition, to try to get people rallied and angry uh, behind Donald Trump. When one campaigns against the democratic process itself, the integrity of it, um, it's, it's a terrible thing because it's one of the norms that you have confidence in that. For whatever reason, I, and I've never quite understood why it's so, but in Argentina, the elections have always worked. Um, they are, you know, people come and they steal ballots and then they have to be replenished, but they're minor, minor transgressions. The vote is the vote. And nobody has ever speculated on fraud in the vote. And that's so important. Uh, I'll tell another story. I've never told this in public. It's kind of embarrassing. But I was in Buenos Aires and I wanted to go out to dinner with, I was taking some, going to dinner with some cousins of mine. And uh, I said, uh, what time should we meet? And they said, we have to go late. Now, if you know anything about Argentina, dinner's already not till 11 o'clock. So when Argentine says we're going to have to go late, it's, oh my God, I'm not going to go till three in the morning. And I said, why do we have to go late? He said, well, we have to work and then we have to go vote. And I said, go vote. What are you voting for? It was the runoff of some municipal election. It was an inconsequential election. And I said, they said, we have to go. I said, well, why don't you skip it? And let's just go to dinner. They said, no, you can't skip it. And I said, well, what, what happens if you don't vote? They said, well, it was a fine. They said, I said, what's the fine? They said, about $10. I said, okay, I'll pay the $20. Let's go to dinner, and which is a horrible thing to do. I should not have done. But they said, no, you can't do that. This is a citizen's obligation. The, and I was so proud of them, you know, the, this idea that there was integrity to this. And so um, I don't know enough about the history of Brazil to say what the consequence was of the attack on the electoral count and the electoral process itself. But this has become, uh, in the United States, become very dangerous because it's made the electoral process itself a zone of contestation. Um, turning to Guillaume's question, um, so uh, on the two-party question, two-party system, um, you won't have two parties uh, so long as you have single-peaked elections, so long as you have winner-take-all elections. You need a proportional system in order uh, to get multiple parties. Otherwise, you always have the wasting of votes problem. This is uh, Duverger's law. This is, uh, it's borne out in practice, except where you have regional power bases that are different uh, configurations. So it raises the question of parliamentary versus presidential systems, which is a long-standing debate. Um, and I think that debate has sort of run its course because the problem is not two parties. The problem is no parties. The problem is that we don't have parties at all uh, and that we have uh, organizations led by one individual. Um, so uh, there's too many. Um, my colleague Rick Pildes speaks about fractionating, fractionating of authority. He speaks about the fracturing of political authority. And going back uh, to Eloise's question, uh, one of the failures of uh, pre-populist governance is that in country after country, these democracies just can't get things done. And the reason they can't get things done is that there's nobody who can take responsibility for government. And for that, you need uh, political parties. So I've become uh, less concerned about presidentialism versus, um, uh, versus parliamentary systems. This was a big debate in political science for the last two decades of the 20th century. Uh, in effect, every, every 
parliamentary system has become more presidential. Uh, tell me what are the constraints on Boris Johnson uh, that are different than the constraints on Donald Trump. And I don't think that there's much, uh, much that separates that. Uh, tell me what there is in France other than Macron at this point, unless one wants the National Front. And so you just don't have uh, very much meaningful distinction, I don't think, as it used to. Um, let me put aside the Supreme Court. I think that we tend to exaggerate uh, the Supreme Court's influence. I think that uh, the decision on gerrymandering was a tragedy. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a defect in our constitutional system that it, if you have any kind of institutional design, you never let the insiders set the rules. And for the same reason, you don't let the incumbent political powers count the votes. You have to have independent authorities for that. And that's just a disaster. The other areas, the Supreme Court's intervention has been less significant. Um, the Voting Rights Act was one of the great heroic pieces of legislation, transformative piece of legislation. But the key divide today is not the black white. The main reason for voter suppression and all that in the United States is not race so much as is partisanship. And the Voting Rights Act was not all that effective as a defense against partisan interventions. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, we have Duga. And Duga. Thomas, okay. Duga and Thomas, and then I have one short question myself. Vera, okay. go, go ahead. Actually, it is not a question, but um, in, in not so strong democracies, um, I understand uh, that the rays of populism, for instance, in Brazil, um, under Bolsonaro's term, um, I understand the rays of, of populism, but in old and relatively strong democracies, such as the US democracy, it's difficult to figure out uh, how institutions are failing in confronting um, Trump's populism, for instance, because um, checks and balances are working, Congress is working, Supreme Court is working as well, agencies, independent agents. So, um, comparing uh, what's happening in, in the U.S. right now and in Brazil, um, I, it's hard for me to figure out how, why institutions are not working in the U.S. in confronting the, the, the kind of uh, populist government. That's it. Thomas? Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, Katya. I was uh, just unlocking my microphone. Uh, thank you very much for this. It was a wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, my question is um, whether uh, the danger can come from, from the inside, uh, from some institutions uh, or, or some of the three branches. I think that this might be what happened uh, here in, in, in Brazil. Uh, I just picked some of the concepts that you uh, presented in the lecture, like the idea that these governments uh, claim to have unmediated authority and a compressed time frame and a no institutional government. I think that uh, sometimes we have that kind of attitude uh, among the courts uh, here in Brazil. We have legal doctrines that have precisely these features. These guys say that uh, it is uh, uh, the role of the judge to interpret the social sentiment of the people and to uh, adjudicate accordingly. Sometimes they say that, um, I can recall a debate in, 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 a, in a trial here in, in, in Brazil that was hugely important. Uh, it was about the, the, uh, the system of financing elections, uh, a case that is very similar to one that was decided in the US 
uh, we had a law saying that the companies can donate up to a certain amount to the public uh, financing. Uh, and, and then there was a debate in our Supreme Court and some judges said, no, we should completely change the electoral system and from now on, nobody can uh, donate anything to the political campaigns. And the other said, look, this is an empirical matter. If you look around the globe, there are many different legislations. This is a permanent difficulty. And in the, in the end prevailed the decision that uh, we have to struck down all the laws and says nobody can give a penny to the elections. And then uh, the first election after this, we elect Bolsonaro. Um, so, so we have these kind of interferences, uh, this non-institutionalized government. I think that Judge Moro was, was a guy like that, the guy who, who arrested Lula and convicted him. He said, no, it doesn't matter legal, uh, uh, the legal process and the due process of law. I have the conviction and uh, you, you, you don't need to demonstrate the occurrence of a single event of corruption to convict the person that you can uh, convict him because of, of some indirect uh, uh, evidence. So in the end of the day, all these features that you pointed uh, that are not working in, in, in populist government, sometimes they are present, uh, they are present in adjudication in, and, and you, you, you undermine the ethos of the rule of law from within. Uh, does it make sense? I don't know if I made myself clear, but uh, I'm just trying to uh, put a different risk uh, coming not from the government itself, but from other institutions that were supposed to protect the judgment of the people and, and, the, uh, and the awareness of, of, of the idea that there is a principle uh, binding us all. Uh, we are losing sense of this. Well, I should say, uh, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more question. Yes. Uh, professor, why do you think that is wide of the mark to compare the current populists, such as the Brazilian president, with fascists, if there are only openly fascist utterance done by him? Um, okay, uh, let me take uh, Thomas's question first, because that's on the judiciary, and then take the other two uh, together. Um, so I should confess, first of all, that uh, Roberto Barroso is a friend of mine. Uh, so uh, um, uh, although we have disagreed in print on some of these issues, uh, so just uh, take that. And then the second point I should say is that uh, uh, last year, I was in Curitiba, uh, and Lula was in prison in Curitiba, and shortly after I left, he was released. And I don't think I, I received enough credit for uh, my intervention to make that happen, um, which was a joke. I had nothing to do with it, but it was striking that he was let go right as I was leaving. But anyway. Um, the um, uh, so let's start with this nature abhors a vacuum and institutions will take power um, if other actors are not performing and um, uh, there is a danger in Brazil right now and I don't think the danger is uh, can be uh, understated that uh, the dysfunctionality and corruption in the heart of the governmental institutions uh, has created uh, all sorts of dislocations. I'm going to just give my sense from the outside. Um, I don't, uh, you know, just take this as an outsider. But when Dilma was removed from office, it looked very much like a congressional coup. It looked like uh, the opposition uh, had taken advantage of the impeachment function in a way that was not anticipated in Brazilian law. And um, I, you know, I, I just, uh, 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 I, I can't help but think 
that there has been too much corruption of the public institutions in Brazil and too much of a void uh, for, two, for quite some time now. The idea that um, a third or more of the legislature of the Congress is under indictment at any point, the idea that a quarter of the Congress switches parties every, every year, uh, usually with allegations of corruption, um, that's an invitation for other authorities to take hold, and that's a very dangerous situation. Are the judges uh, excessively uh, uh, taking power in Brazil? Um, I, I think I'd like to defer on that. I've written on some of the uh, social welfare uh, decisions of the Brazilian court, which I think are um, both well-intentioned and likely uh, not effective or perhaps uh, counter-effective, but um, I, I, I really think I should leave that to the side. I've read your, I've read your writings on it. Uh, I am friends with Conrado Rubia, and so I, I understand, uh, you know, this this line of argument. But um, I think that the main threat to Brazilian the stability of Brazilian democracy right now uh, is not the courts, and I think it's coming from the executive branch, and I don't think it's the legislature at present either. Um, with regard to uh, the question of uh, why the American in institutions uh, are, are failing, Vera's question, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a hard, it's a hard question. I had assumed that every president comes to office and complains about the bureaucracy, complains that they can't get anything done, complains true, but it's also true that they complain because within boundaries, they don't challenge it. They understand that that's the, that that's the mainstay of, of the American government. And that doesn't matter whether it's Republicans or Democrats who are in office. I think what is different is that if you have no commitment to the integrity of these institutional arrangements, you can challenge them in ways that are underappreciated at law. So it's easy to have laws that say that agencies have to act within the Administrative Procedures Act. It's, it's, you can mandate how their heads are selected. You can mandate the level of congressional oversight. But what happens if you just simply don't appoint anybody to run those agencies? Most of our agencies in the United States, most of our uh, take the State Department, most of the uh, officials below the Secretary of State have not been appointed. We haven't had uh, somebody in charge of our security services for years now who is officially appointed. And under these circumstances, the institutions fail. You don't, you don't staff them, you don't fund them, you don't appropriate, you don't give them uh, the kinds of people they need to make them work. And then they begin to fail. And, uh, and so um, I think that uh, this goes back to the question that Eloise asked about the world the populace inherited. Many of our institutions were surprisingly weak and we did not realize the, the frailty of them until they were under direct assault. And that's what has really changed uh, in the last four years. We've never had uh, an administration, uh, really not since Andrew Jackson in the early 19th century, that has tried to attack the institutions. You know, I'm a, I'm a child of, the, of uh, the generation of 68 and after 68. So we have a president who spends his time confronting our security apparatus. He attacks the FBI, he attacks the CIA. I find myself rooting for the FBI and the CIA against our elected officials. I mean, there's nothing in my temperamental background that prepares me for that, but that's where I am. And that's where everybody I know is. We root for the established institutions that are so much under attack at this point um, even when we recognize 
that we have difficulties with law enforcement in the United States. We have difficulties with the history of our CIA, et cetera, et cetera, but we can't function without institutions. And um, it's, it, it's a difficult confrontation with how weak they are. Uh, the, uh, the, the last question is, uh, Katya, the, uh, the relationship between fascists and populists. And this is a hard question because um, as I noted in the introductory chapter, there are many, many books out there now in all over the world in all sorts of lang in every language on the nature of populism. And everybody's writing about their particular, whether it's about Modi or about Orban or about Kaczynski. And um, these books break down into certain categories. There are those that are the economic Terminists, and I think they have a very important point for the reasons that I always asked about. There are those that are the psychological temperament of these leaders, how they're all a little bit, uh, uh, the technical term I think is crazy. Um, and uh, so, and I think those books have a point. There are the, the books that focus on the demagogy of these heads of, the, of these uh, leaders, and those are important also. But I think that, uh, and one of them is, one of the strains of this is to compare the rhetorical style of a Modi or of an Orban uh, or of a Duterte to Mussolini, to the, the fascist tradition. Um, and there's something to that. There is something about the incitement of mass hostility, the outsider, the hatred of the immigrants, the hatred of the, of the ethnic and racial and religious minorities. All of that is there, and I don't want to deny it at all, but what's not there is it's not organized in a disciplined political movement, except perhaps for Modi's BJP in India, which is uh, something that could transition into a fascist party. And that's a real, a real threat there. Um, but they don't have that kind of institutional, dis institutionalized, disciplined existence. Where is Bolsonaro's party? Where are his foot soldiers? Where is his capacity to mobilize? Where are Trump's foot soldiers? Where, you know, these are self-appointed people who run around with guns, but there is no disciplined army. There's nothing that's mobilizable. There's no political party that marches in the streets with a uniform, and there is no ideology. Mussolini had a fascist credo. He invoked ancient Rome. He had something ideological that gave a raison d'etre to these groups, not to mention, of course, Hitler and National Socialism, or on the other side of the authoritarian uh, uh, spectrum, uh, not to mention, uh, you know, the Stalinist uh, parties of, uh, of the Soviet Union or of the Soviet bloc. But so these don't have it. And instead, they call on the people to elect them every, every X amount of time. And interestingly, uh, they don't try to cancel elections for the most part. They try to make it very difficult for the opposition to win, but they don't try to cancel elections. They don't declare themselves uh, president for life. They declare that they will be eligible for life, but they have to run every number of years. And I think that all of these are differences from the fascists. And the other thing is, if you go to Budapest today, and, and it's, a, it's a nasty regime in, in Hungary, it's wonderful. You can read anything. You can go eat. Go, well, today you can't go anywhere. But, you know, a year ago, you could go into the cafes. You could go anywhere. You go to Delhi. You can go out in the street. You can enjoy. You would not feel uh, the oppressiveness of the regime. Um, and so I think that um, we lose uh, credibility with supporters 
when we don't recognize that they are playing to, to real and legitimate grievances of the population and they are elected. Sometimes there's fraud, but usually they're pretty popular. Putin would win handily with 70% of the vote if he ran a clean election. For whatever reason, he has to run corrupt elections so he gets 80%. I, you know, I don't understand why, but that's important to him. And Duda won in Poland, and I thought it was a huge setback, but that was a clean election. You know, it was imperfect, but it was a relatively clean election, and he won. And that's the unfortunate reality of a regime that has a real electoral base that keeps it in office. Thank you, Professor. Do you think it's still possible to have one more question? The last sure. one? Of course. Manu, go ahead. Thank you. Manu. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your speech. Uh, are you listening to me? Yes, I can. Yes. Um, I, will, I will ask in English because I was bragging about my English to Eduardo uh, in here at, uh, at our chat. And so I'll have to speak it in English now. And this is most the, the most important thing about this question. But uh, well, besides that, uh, we, we you said a lot about uh, to think uh, in a post-Trump world in November. But I am now trying to think that if we, with our institutions, can think about in a non-Trump universe, that those kind of people doesn't happen in politics. Because those guys, they use the institutions outside the institutions. And they undermine our democracy, just saying about it and using that. Because, well, if the, 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 um, our Congress doesn't work, well, they will go publicly to, through social media and talk about the guys from there and put people there. Because now we have soldiers that are helping Bolsonaro to create this. Like, it's not like the, the same old kind of soldiers that we, we used to have and in other times, but we have a lot of people that are, are actually engaged in the fandom and sustain and his popularity in this, in this month, it was like huge. And they still have those guys and they still have people that are quite well, he's right. So uh, how does our institutions can work to avoid this kind of thing and that this, this kind of un no democratic speech to happen. And it's just that. Well, that's the hardest question about how you repair and what the, in, what the mechanisms are. Um, let me uh, address that uh, uh, by focusing on the question of, that you raised about social media and why social media is so dangerous here. Um, the, uh, so there's a question that that uh, that we've been wondering about, or political scientists have been wondering about for some time, about why the political parties emerged as such powerful institutions in every democratic country. And they uh, there's an American political scientist named uh, V. O. Key um, who described the parties as providing three things, as being made up of three constituencies: those who are in the government those who are the foot soldiers of the party who do all the work to get it elected and uh, those who are the um, the elites of the party the the uh, commanding officers the, the the power brokers in the party and that they're always in tension because they all need each other and in particular the candidates need the party because the party provides its money the party provides it access to people, part, political parties in, in West, Western Europe used to always have party newspapers that were the main way of reaching people. In the United States, we have a custom of what we call yard signs that every election we put uh, uh, signs on our grass and uh, in front of our house and the poll work, the workers from the parties would go and mobilize people to 
uh, to put the yard signs there. And so that's BOP and that explains what the parties were. Now let me introduce another uh, another conception, which is from Ronald Coase and his famous es essay on uh, the nature of the firm. And the basic Coasean insight is that we always make a decision, people in business always make a decision whether to make something themselves or to buy it from somebody else. And if you internalize production, it's more expensive, but you can control quality. If you externalize it and you buy from somebody who just specialized in that, then uh, it's cheaper, but you have agency costs. You have problems of control. And so in another part of this book, I talk about the political party solved the transaction cost problem by making it possible for candidates to reach out to many people, to raise money, and to organize it. And in exchange, they had to be part of the congressional or the legislative delegation and act to further the party's ideological or political interests so that there would be faithful returns in the future. What does social media do? It means I don't need the party. I can raise money on the web. I can reach people on Facebook. Um, in 2016, Donald Trump pioneered the idea of running for president on Twitter. Nobody had ever had ever done this before. So if you looked at Hillary Clinton's uh, Twitter feeds in 2016, they were all go to my website where you'll see 54 pr program programmatic points that explain the universe, which if there's a human being out there who ever read all 54 points, I haven't met such a person. I'm not sure I ever want to. Um, whereas for Trump, it was a few words that always ended up with sad or pathetic or something. It was always very evocative. And it reached people partially because of his fame and his notoriety, but also because of his skill in doing that. And that meant that he could overwhelm the Republican Party by direct communication to the population, which had never been available to a candidate before. Brazil has done an excellent job of trying to break down some of those monopolies by guaranteeing equal access to television time that the way, I think the way that Brazil has distributed uh, uh, political uh, uh, advertisement time to candidates is a model for how well it can be done. But it doesn't matter because that's not the medium by which we reach people any, anymore. It, at least in the United States, you know, my kids don't have televisions. They have, uh, you know, they, they watch on Hulu. I mean, it, it doesn't, the, the idea that you broadcast television is important, maybe still true in some places, but it's a dying field. And so what social media allowed is a style of elections which broke down the institutions that were supposed to control democracy. And what was most frightening about the Trump presidency is that he went from being a candidate on Twitter to being a president on Twitter. And so all of a sudden he could translate a non-institutional form of politics into a non-institutional form of governance. And um, I hate to say this, but you know, I, like many others, believed in the dream of Tahrir Square in, in Cairo. I thought that everybody carrying an iPhone and being on social media was a moment of, you know, enlightenment style liberation. It turns out it's far more complicated and that uh, the, unfortunately, the social media has further compromised um, the institutional foundations. And I think one of the, the last section of the book, which I'm uh, just turning to now, um, is really on how you repair that. And I think this is the hardest question for all of us is how to get a 
an institutionalized form of politics back into something that's tractable in an increasingly non-institutional world. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Professor, for the question, for the answer. And yeah, social media is actually the, the biggest problem right now because there is in the, in the New York Times, I guess, uh, an article that says how YouTube radicalized Brazilians. And it's quite important to read that and to understand how all these things works right now because they are quite responsible for that. So thank you for your answer and for your time. Thank you. Katja, we are not listening. We are, Katja, you're okay, muted. Yes. No, yeah. Thank you for being with us for your marvelous talk and answers. And before ending, Thomas, would you like to have a word about the next seminar coming next week? Uh, or, thank or in you. What philosophy? Yeah, th that's very kind of you, Katya. Uh, well, um, can I show you the the program of the the, the next seminar that we have? Yes, yes, yes. 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 Marina, Ma it's something very. Uh, uh, I think um, uh, it's very very quick. Just a second, I'm getting it. Marina, he keeps that the host. Hold on. Uh, yeah, I'm a little nervous. I have to find the, the program, Katya. It's just one. one. Uh, yeah, I got it. It's, if you allow me to share the screen, I can show you. Okay, yes. There it is. Can you see the, the screen? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, this one, this is the next one. Uh, on September 9th, we get uh, Margaret Martin. She will be talking about censorship in the age of identity politics. And then we get another one uh, on September 28th with Dan Priu. He will be talking about uh, dwarking in legal realism. Um, there is another one uh, from Jerry Postema on October 7th, uh, Custom in International Law. And finally, in October 21st, Judicial Independence under Anti-Liberal Government with Kinland Chappelle, Renata Witt, uh, Sadursky, and Emilio Mayer. Uh, these are the seminars that we are holding for this year in, in, in legal and political philosophy. So. Thank you for spreading the word. You can find everything in the in the website uh, of UFMG uh, PhD program. But it's it's an event that is co-organized by UFMG and UFPR. You guys too, and uh, USP, uh, Puki Minas, and uh, Federal University of Para. So that's thank, thank you very you much for this, Katya. Yeah, yeah. Lira, would you like to say something? Yeah, just like to thank you professor samuel isakarov it was really a huge um opportunity to debate a little bit before uh the issue of your book so i'm waiting to read the book hopefully um uh when the book uh will be available uh we are we will be in a post-Trump era. <laughs> so thank you, thank you very much for your kind um, speaking. Thank you for having me. Um, I also look forward to reading the book because that means I'll be done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.